very quickly an idea with a deck of cards uh, that could be borrowed. Uh, a borrowed deck of cards would have to have a specific attribute to them, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But uh, let's say we have this deck of cards here, which is a bicycle deck of cards, a, a typical uh, kind of set that you would find most places. Uh, we would want to get rid of the jokers very quickly. We don't want to have those because uh, that could arouse some uh, suspicion in what we're doing. Uh, so we'll find those very quickly. Joker, joker, joker. And I think we're okay. All right, so uh, no jokers, don't need those. Uh, the deck should probably be shuffled um, right before you do the trick to, to again, dispel any suspicion. So uh, you have a deck of cards, and what you tell the spectator is, is that you want them to freely select one, uh, that you will uh, spread through the deck just like this, and then you want them to reach out and touch uh, any card that they want, any time and anywhere that they want to. Let's say that they uh, select this one right here, you'll square it up, show them their card, have them commit it to memory, very important that they can see that and that they remember. Tell them that you're going to place it right back where you found it, and then you're going to turn it over to the spectator to shuffle. So you're not controlling the cards in any way. They had a free selection. Uh, they can shuffle the deck in any way that they choose. It doesn't matter. They don't need to have any kind of specific instructions. It can be any kind of shuffle. And then uh, have them give the cards back and explain to them that they had free selection of any card in the deck, that all of the cards are indeed different, that there's nothing about any of these cards that is similar to another card. All of them are different. There's no particular order to it. In fact, once they selected the card, they were able to freely shuffle the deck, and that's exactly what they did. So at this point, there's no way that you could know what their card is, and there's no way you could know where it is because you didn't really have a chance to control it. Um, this is going to be kind of a mental, mind-reading kind of trick. Uh, you tell the spectator that what you want them to do is to concentrate on their card, particularly their number and their suit, the number and the suit of the card that they selected, and that what you're going to do is you're going to spread through uh, one card at a time, and you want them to identify uh, just in their mind what their card is and where it's at, okay? So again, they're thinking of number and suit. That's all they're thinking of. And you're going to spread through the cards uh, just like this and have them look specifically at every single card that's in there, thinking of number and suit of their card. And don't tell me if you see it, because I don't want you to give it away. I just want you to be concentrating on it. And I want to make sure you see absolutely every single card. So you're thinking number and suit. Okay, and now we're here right at the very end, right there. Okay, so you've seen everything. Number and suit, you're thinking about it now. A couple of questions, and I'm going to try to figure it out, all the information just from these few questions. First question, did you see your card closer to the top of the deck, which is the last cards that you saw, or closer to the bottom of the deck, those first cards that you saw? Now, at this point, the spectator should say uh, the same answer. Any, any spectator should say, I didn't see my card in there. Okay. Now, if they weren't paying attention and they weren't really taking it very seriously and they say, well, I saw it in a particular spot, you can actually go on with this trick. Uh, but let's assume that they were paying attention and they said, I didn't see my card in there. Say, well, that's very interesting. Um, not only do I know what your card is, but more importantly, I know where your card is, even though you don't. Uh, it's in the box. Go ahead and take a look. So at that point, the spectator would open up the box and take a look, and they would actually find that nothing is in there. And then you could say, no, 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 you misunderstand. You see, I didn't mean inside of the box. I mean, it's actually in the box. It's, it's part of the box. It's right here. If you take a look, it's printed. It's moved right onto the box cover. It's the uh, Ten of Hearts right there. That's your card that you freely selected. Uh, so anyway, this obviously operates on a basic principle that we've talked about before on this channel, but I want to show you a simple control to make it appear as though a card has uh, uh, disappeared or has been removed from a deck when in fact it is not, and I want to focus on that. A uh, Kind of a little move that you could probably use in a lot of different ways uh, in a lot of different scenarios when you need to um, maybe use a duplicate card or just make it appear as though someone's card is no longer available somewhere. Uh, you could even use it in conjunction with palming a card out uh, such that you would need to uh, maybe stay one step ahead or be one step behind from what they're suspecting. You could make it appear as though the card has disappeared before you palm it out uh, you know, so that you don't raise suspicion. Uh, but anyway, we'll take a look at that little move and talk about some other parts of this kind of an effect. 
uh, and also the ways in which uh, this can work with a borrowed deck and some of the ways in which it can. So on to the explanation. Okay, very quick explanation. This is obviously based on a force, and the attribute that you need to have in the deck of cards that you're using is that it needs to have some kind of a card that is printed on it so that you can reveal uh, in the end. Uh, bicycle decks, at least the uh, current printing of them, have a ten of hearts on it. Some of the older versions used to have uh, that graphic where they showed half of uh, the back was the back of the playing card and half of it was the face of a playing card. Uh, and it usually was the ten of hearts as well on those older decks. Um, if you have one that only shows the icons on the front and then a full back that would look kind of like that, that obviously won't work. But what you could do is if it was your own deck, you could uh, do something like uh, take a, a marker and write in uh, just a, uh, a suit and a number and, and then just come up with your own force card that's in there. Okay. Um, another possibility is that you could do this with your own deck using a duplicate card. Uh, and actually have it come inside the box uh, so that when they open up the box they would pull it out and they would see their card in there that they selected. So, um, uh, Although this makes it a little bit more interesting to reveal that something's printed on the box. Uh, so look for that. I know that there are a lot of other card makers that also print uh, some kind of card somewhere on it or a grouping of cards which you might be able to use this in that way too. Um, I have a number of Carta Mundi cards. These aren't very good cards. They're kind of mediocre cards, but they tend to have a ten of diamonds printed on the back. So um, you can you can do that with any cards that have a box that have a card that's printed on it for a reveal. There are even some cards out there that are made by uh, you know magicians uh, for magicians. They're just you know really really flashy kind of nice looking super you know, classy looking cards that have reveals built into the boxes on purpose just for this kind of thing. So obviously you could use a deck of cards that has that as well uh, and give a little bit more of a magical reveal if they can find uh, their card printed in there in an unusual way. So anyway, those are some possibilities. Maybe you can come up with some other ways to reveal from the box too, but you need to have cards that have that. Um, now here's how this works very briefly. Uh, it really can be a completely shuffled deck of cards. Uh, you need to do a couple of controls here to get it set up right in front of the spectator. The first thing is is that you would take the uh, deck out and you need to uh, locate the card that you're going to be forcing. So you take it out. I know that on this uh, deck, on this pack, that the Ten of Hearts is going to be my force card. I kind of want to have that out of view so that they're not, they don't see that. Uh, they, we want to reveal that near the end of the trick. Uh, so I take the deck out, and then what I want to do is I can very simply, right in front of the spectator, call their card out. Now, you don't have to do a spread call if you are not comfortable with that. You don't need to do a spread call at all in this, except for in one other place, and even then you don't have to do it. Um, you can really just simply cut the force card to the top of the deck and it will get you set up for this trick. So under the guise of removing jokers or under the guise of just showing that all of the cards are different, you can either um, call their card out like this. So as soon as I see, I'll take a joker out right there. As soon as I see the ten of hearts, I will call it to the top of the deck. See, I've pulled it out. I have a uh, another uh, a video on my channel that deals with a uh, card calling. You can find that if you want to learn the spread call. Uh, and then there's the other joker. So what I've done is I've controlled this, the force card to the top of the deck and now I'm ready to go. And then I said you probably want to shuffle the cards before you do the trick too. And that's probably a good idea if you shuffle right before you have them select, but you want to make sure that you retain the top few cards or at least the top card on the top of the deck when you do that shuffle. So you do a shuffle uh, and make sure that they see that you shuffled it. Now at this point you come to the force. Now you could control it to the top and do this force or do a number of forces uh, uh, like this one that deal with a force card from the top of the deck. Or if you wanted to, you could have forced it to the bottom somehow. One way is to force it first to the top and then when you do your shuffle, do an overhand shuffle, peel off the top card and get it to the bottom and then you can force from the bottom using the force of your choice. I like to use this force because it is, it's an absolute killer for almost anybody. This won't fool magicians, but it will fool everybody else. They don't fully understand the mechanics of what's going on here, and it seems absolutely fair and free. This is called a call force. Uh, it doesn't really require that you call a card. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be kind of doing the reverse of an underspread call uh, by taking the top card 
and peeling it off the top first. And if you want to make this look really fair, you can peel off the first card and then peel off maybe a couple more on top of that before you start spreading fairly to have them select. But what I've done is I've set myself up so that the force card is on the bottom of the deck and I'm feeding all of the other cards in on top of that card or the group of cards that it's with. Okay. So one more time, this is again the, the uh, call force. Uh, I tell them I'm going to spread the cards and I want them to reach out and touch a card, uh, any card that they want. I'm going to spread them out like this and you can kind of demonstrate with a couple before spreading fairly. Once they touch a card, uh, what you're doing is you're pinching that card and all the cards above it between your force card on the bottom and the rest of the deck. Uh, you're going to square the cards up the side and I find that it's good to square the top two before turning it over to make sure that everything is completely square all the way around and this isn't left out of place, maybe too low. Okay, so you square it up, then you show them the card, get it away from your face, let them see it, and commit it to memory. Very fairly, you're going to put it back where you found it, even though that's not really where we found it. It looks like it is. And then you let them shuffle. Uh, now, you know the card because you forced it. And it doesn't matter that you don't know where it is. Uh, it, the fact that you don't know what it is and the fact that they're um, uh, shuffling the deck should automatically indicate that you don't know where it is either. Okay. Now, if you don't know what it is and you don't know where it is, then there's no reason for you not to look at the faces. So there's a few ways now to get situated to make the card disappear. Uh, essentially, what we want is we want to get the selected card back to the top of the deck again. Okay. Now, there's a few ways to do it. One way is that you can look at the cards yourself and just say, look, I could look at these cards all I want. And then as soon as you get to the Ten of Hearts, you can go to do an underspread call. And right as you start the move, turn the deck over and show them the faces. So in that move, I've called it out. Now, that's not what I did on the video, but that's probably what I would do if I was performing this. On the video, I showed you another uh, a way to do this. One way is to show the faces very fairly, but do a reverse spread. Now, what this does is it hides all of the index, uh, uh, all of the indices of the cards behind your thumb that you're spreading from. And that's good because it, it gives you an advanced notice of what cards are coming. And what you do is you just spread them out and you say, look, we started with a completely normal deck of cards. All of the cards are completely different. I'm just kind of spreading these out. Now, once I get to my Ten of Hearts, I can see it here, even though they can't see it. What I do is I push it to the bottom, and then I take that off so it's hidden away, and then I start to spread on top in small groups, okay, while I'm explaining that all the cards are different. This is what I did on the video. And I'm being really, really loosey-goosey with this, right? There's no reason why there should be any suspicion because I don't know what the card is and they shuffled it so I shouldn't know where it is. All right? So what I've done is I've controlled it to the top. I've essentially just cut it to the top of the deck. And now we're set up to do uh, this little move where you can hide the card as a double. Uh, and this is not like a double lift. It's not complicated at all. But since we have it at the top, what we're going to do is we're going to hide this card underneath the second to last card as we spread through in a surefire way to make sure that they don't see it. Uh, the way this is going to work is you're going to explain that I'm going to spread through the cards. I want you to see absolutely every single one. And as I'm spreading, I want you to be thinking about your card. Now, don't tell me when you see it, but I want you to be looking for it. And I want you to be concentrating on your card. Turn the cards over, and you can do a couple of things. You can do a pinky count to two. Uh, which I'm really bad at a pinky count. Okay, so I don't do that. I don't. I don't typically do pinky counts. I don't trust myself to do it. What I do is I do kind of a little Martin Nash move where I just kind of bevel in the bottom cards until I get to two. And you just do this within about an inch of space while you're holding in biddle and then holding kind of in dealing underneath. So if I spread forward. Uh, just so that I can get to two cards, so that I can see the force card, and then I see the card above it. I can then stick my pinky over top of that edge and catch a break whenever I square them back up. Now, they can't see this from where they're at, and you can do it really, really slowly as you're explaining what you're going to do. You catch your break. Make sure you keep this hand over so they don't see that break. Okay, And then you say, I'm going to spread. Now, what you want to do is you want to start spreading right away so that you can cover up your break. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm holding my top card like this. I have my pinky in there at the break, and I'm squaring it against the palm of my hand uh, at the top corner. 
this cannot go anywhere. There's no way that I'm going to be able to show that there's two cards. They're completely squared up against each other, against a squared packet. So I have my pinky break. I'm squaring it up at the corner. Uh, and then I proceed to uh, spread through the cards. And I have them think of their card and look for their card. And I talk about how I don't want them to tell me when they see it, but just to be looking forward to be concentrating on it. And I get to the end, and it seems like they have fairly seen everything. I spread it uh, back together, or rather close up the spread. I turn it over, and then I ask my question. Did you see your card closer to the uh, bottom of the deck, or the first cards that you saw, or closer to the top of the deck, the last cards that you saw? They should say that they didn't see it at all, in which case you go on with the reveal, as you saw in the example. <laughs> If they weren't paying attention and they flub this up and they say, well, I think I saw it near the top of the deck, um, you can say, okay, so the last cards that you saw, cut off those cards. Uh, I'm sorry, actually, let's, let's start with this one. Maybe they say the bottom of the deck. You would cut off the top cards and you would set aside the top cards because you don't need them. Okay? Uh, and you actually have gotten rid of the force card and you're pretty free and clear at this point. Then you would go through the process again very fairly. Okay? You would show the cards and say, okay, I want you to think about it and concentrate. You saw it here. Okay. Then do the same question again. Did you see it near the first cards? Of the but, you know, at some point they should say, I don't see it anywhere in there. Okay. So you say, well, we know it's not in here because you didn't see it in here before. We know that they're not in here. Uh, I know where it's at. It's in here. Now, if they say that they saw it at the top, if, again, they flub this up, what you can do is cut off the top of the cards by doing a, um, a slip cut. So you're going to put your fingers on the top card, and you're going to slip off the top card when you cut off the top of the, the deck there. And then set the bottom aside, and you slipped off their card. At which point you can go through this again more freely or even have them look through them uh, and see if they can find it. So if they really blow it, then that's what you can do. Now the goal, though, is to control them in such a way so that they're taking it seriously and that they're really thinking and concentrating and looking for their cards that so you only have to do that once. And then you uh, come up with a reveal. So anyway, a little bit of procedure in there. Uh, you can use any force that you want. You don't have to use a call force, but a call force is very powerful. Uh, you can uh, control the card to the top any way that you want. You don't have to use a call, but a call is very powerful. Uh, and then in the end, uh, you want to acquire a break above their card once you've controlled it to the top and uh, an indifferent card, square it against your, uh, the palm of your hand with your pinky break and then the front finger up here so that you can very, very easily spread all the cards and apparently show that it's disappeared.